All right, I think my uh, my third world internet has uh, has caught up with us. Woohoo! Greetings from the dark continent, conscious Garakal Hill, Adams van Sale here to shine a light on the, not just the goings on down south, but to talk to interesting guests from all across the world that share their insights in regards to their passions and the things that they uh, the things that they bring to the world and the things that they use to uh, create art and to discuss ideas. Tonight's guest is uh, Akira the Don, a music producer and artist whose music that I personally uh, quite enjoy. Uh, he's, his music forms parts of some of my most quintessential playlists. And uh, he actually did a, a great uh, interview recently with a, a friend of mine, Dylan Ghos. Um, he, you might also know him as ex ex Existential Delight. And uh, lastly, just uh, a little bit of more context. So, uh, Akira the Don is a British musician and he is the creator of the meaning wave genre of music. So we're going to be talking a bit about music and meaning as you can deduce from the title. Welcome on the show, Akira or Adam, and uh, um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Gracias, hermano. Um, mucho gusto. How are you doing? I'm good and you? I'm wonderful. Uh, who's got the best internet? <laughs> who's got the well, best third world internet? I've got the Mexican internet. I've got the South African one, so I think there's maybe a competition there. I don't know how good the internet is all the way on that side of the pond. It's pretty good. I was doing an interview recently with the Atlas Society, uh, an Ayn Rand organization based uh, in Malibu, and uh, it was a live stream, and halfway through, the internet cut out, and uh, <laughs> the lady who was interviewing me was going, Ugh, Mexican internet, and then it turned out it was her internet that's how it goes and uh, also a nice little coincidence here um dylan house existential hey. delight is in the conversation he's in the live hey. chat uh, we are non dylan nice to see you here and i see uh there's a lot of people already uh, trickling in here into the live chat remember if you have any questions you have the opportunity to ask them live and i will uh, i'll pose them uh to mr kira the don but uh before we uh, get to some questions from the chat i just want to start off with a I think it might give the impression of a simple question, but it's, I think, the best way to start off the conversation, where to build the foundation, and that is specifically the Akira the Don story. Where did this all start? How did you end up here where you're producing this new genre of music, where you're taking the internet by storm? And uh, what's that journey a bit, uh, what was that journey like? What's the Akira the Don origin myth, if you will? Well, uh it's missing some stuff because I don't have a huge amount of memory uh, mm -hmm. prior to sort of six, seven-ish. Mm. So uh, that will have to be sort of like <laughs> delved into a future date. But when I remember stuff, I start remembering things at around that point. And I very much uh, love music and comics and uh, art and stuff of that nature. And I'm making music in a crude fashion using cassettes and copying bits of cassettes to other cassettes and back again and pulling the tape out and chopping it up and sticking it back together with sticking sellotape on the un underneath side of it. And I'm recording things of news uh, reels, I'm recording bits of news reels mm -hmm. and putting those over music uh, in this sort of crude fashion. And I'm making mixtapes and comic books and I'm selling them at school and uh, I'm attempting to form bands. Uh, I have a band called Ken and the Barbies. Uh, with a couple of girls at school. I'm Ken and they're the Barbies. And um, they just sort of dance around while I mime over records. Um, and it's great, you know. So it kind of begins around there. And uh, and I, I become a rapper and a, and a producer of records. And uh, I become fascinated with the skits aspect of records, which is not as prevalent now as once it was. There was a period around sort of like uh late 80s early 90s i guess you'd have rap people like ice cube would have you know like a one and a half minute long skit before a song which would either be a bit of a movie or it would be a kind of like almost like a mini play or something 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 in acted act it out in order to express more than one or different something different to what one could do within lyrics seemingly uh and then bands like the manic street preachers would have similar things and people like Morrissey would be peppering his records with these samples 
And I was, I'd start, I was making these mixtapes and I was like, well, what if a whole song was almost like a skit? What if I took an interview? What if I said like an early one, I did say uh, Jack Kirby, who is the guy who invented much of the Marvel and DC universe. He was a World War II vet um, and very hardworking individual who kind of mainlined much of what the whole superhero movie thing over the past 15 years, he invented most of that. And uh, he would say that, you know, he was, he, it was kind of God working through him or something. But anyway, I took a, you know, a whole interview of him just talking about that process and put that to music. And I would slightly chop it just to eke out the rhythm. If a syllable hit on a beat, that would make it a little stickier and more like an actual song. I wasn't, you know, uh, stretching it or re-pitching it or anything like that, you know. So anyway, I, I sort of experimented with that sort of stuff for years and then eventually found myself in the position in around 2017 when I wasn't currently rapping because I'd stopped rapping because um, I'd realized I was not yet wise enough to communicate that which I wished to communicate on the third album I was about to make. So I was off, I, you know, I was like, well, I haven't had a kid yet, so I can't be talking about certain things uh, and stuff like that. Anyway, and then I did have a kid. Um, but I was, it dawned on me that some of the things I wanted to talk about, I could just take other people talking about those things, i.e. people. Here's the thing, right? Um, I was finding, I'd listen to certain records where people were attempting to uh, communicate something worthwhile. And they would come across as somewhat insincere and cringe. Because they were not coming from a place of truly embodying that of which they spoke, right? And you know that. If somebody is coming from a place of inauthenticity, if you're in any way clued in, you will know, you'll know that right away. Uh, and it dawned on me, you know, I could someone like, say, uh, Jordan Peterson, who'd been thinking about why it was that we ended up in the horrible situation that we ended up in in the 20th century. For He's been thinking about that for 40 years. He's been investigating that for 40 years. So perhaps him talking about that would be about the most authentic way of communicating things on that subject, right? Someone like Alan Watts, who'd uh, been on every side of Western and Eastern religion and been in and out of all these wormholes for decades, he'd be the right person to talk about certain ideas and so on and so forth. And, mm. uh, and so it developed. Mm. But uh, when that when you're listening to that type of track where you're taking someone's speech and you're turning it into a track or a music track, mm. is there something else going on in your brain uh, as opposed to when you're just listening to that podcast or just listening to that audio? What's what's going on there? What's the psychology behind that? Uh, what's going on behind the scenes? Well, when I first heard, if it's if it's something from a podcast or a lecture, when I first hear it, I hear it. So it instantly presents itself as somewhat musical. And I'm instantly sort of starting to hear what kind of music that might be. And I'm instantly hearing the rhythm and the melody. So there's rhythm and melody and everything. And once you start noticing that, you notice that. You know, it's like uh, Grant Morrison used to say, uh, the first step towards becoming a chaos magician is to notice synchronicities. And then the more synchronicities you notice, the more synchronicities you notice. And then you're very aware of how magical the world is. And once you're aware of how magical the world is, it's not too much of a stretch to think that you could actually affect it in a magical fashion. It's a bit like mm -hmm. uh, the way Scott Adams talks about persuasion. It's once you realize how pers persuadable people are, then being persuasive yourself isn't as big as a stretch as maybe it was, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's something like that. Once you start to see it, you see it everywhere. And then when I'll take the piece and I'll sit down with it, then I'll, you know, I'll sort of work out what the specifically, okay, this is the tempo. And okay, I think this is what the melody is. And I think these are the chords and so on and so forth. Because hmm. there is something that also happens when you listen to one of your tracks. And that's the fact that I think for many people, they experience it as it makes it easier to remember a lot of this material. Hmm. And uh, I can only think to my own personal experience when I was learning in primary school and in high school, I would create little rhymes or create little mm -hmm. uh, uh, codes that I can remember, but I usually give a little rhythm to it. And it just makes knowledge easier to retain. Doesn't mean that's how everyone's brain works. Maybe you think that's how everyone's brain works. Um, but in my experience, that that's how it helped me learn. And I mean that for let's take an example, one of your tracks where you take um, 
Jocko Willink's reading of If, the poem mm. If by Rudyard Kipling. Mm. If I were to read that poem 10 times, it wouldn't stick. But if I've listened to that song 10 times, mm. I can recite that poem out of memory now. And that's pretty much the perfect example of that effect in motion. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it was something I wanted to do. Uh, I can now recite, you know, a quarter of Marcus Aurelius's meditations back to front. Uh, I can recite a bunch of um, Seneca. I can recite a bunch of uh, Epictetus. Uh, you know, I can recite Invictus back to front. All these various things. Uh, I did notice this when I was very young. I quit school when I was 16. But the last thing I did, um, the last exams I did, I read my revision notes over ambient music and played right. them when I went to sleep. And that was the that was all of my revision. And the mm. thing, the the exams where I did that, I did pretty well. You know, mm. so I, I figured that out from early. It's a combination of the rhythm, but also melody is an a, an extra level. So you could just have the rhythm, right? Mm. But adding a melody, it's like the you know the we all know this because this how how do you know your ABCs? Mm. You know your ABCs because that little song. Yeah, well, the 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 months of the year. Months of the year. What's your month yeah. of the year song? I don't think I have one. Um, na 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 na. Da, 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 da. <laughs> where, did, where, where did the months go with that? Where is that January, joke? February, March, April, <laughs> May, Juni, Juli, August, right. September. <laughs> Fire. Oh. Right. Exactly. But I mean, there's there's something there. It's There's yeah, a well, reason why I think most teachers use that type of medium to teach basic things, as you said, the alphabet, days of the year, small little things like that. Before the printing press, People used to walk around with books in their heads, right? We had books for a long time before we had the printing press. And mm -hmm. people knew these books other than monks. There were people who didn't have access to the scrolls in the monastery who knew books. It's because they remembered them. And the way they remembered them was that they structured them in verse and rhyme. This is why our, a lot of our old, mm -hmm. you know, Gilgamesh, things of that nature, right? These are epic poems, right? Iliad is an epic right. poem. It's structured in such a fashion that it's it has rhythm quite explicitly in it so people would recite these things to each other around the campfire or whatever it was at the wedding or wherever right and you know auntie gladys would have a whole chapter and uncle billy would have a whole chapter and everyone would do that and you would therefore be um a part of the telling of the story and a little of you would come out in that story right a little of your inflection a little of your melody a little of your rhythm would come out and uh, this is why people, uh, you know, are so up upset now about, you know, Disney having bought all the stories. And this is why people have these YouTube channels. And that's why there's this whole cacophony around storytelling and mythology, because people used to be a part of it. And now these corporations bought it all. And uh, not just corporations, because it's also the inverse corporations. These sort of socialist societies did the same thing. These be behemoths took ownership of the stories and they said only we can tell the stories and this is how they're told and you shut up and just take the story people for a long time were involved in the telling of the story and they crave that you know mm. i mean that's a that there's such an important place for the storyteller he's the man who who brings history to life and brings mythology to life as i said earlier tongue in cheek uh, every person has their origin myth where they come from how they got here every people and culture also a nation or civilization also has a, an origin myth and these origin myths were often as you correctly stated uh, were often delivered through uh, musical speech or through poetry or the epic poem mm -hmm. or through these types of presentations and that's how, you remember them. That's how people remember them. it's, it's mm, absolutely it's as simple as that's how you know auntie gladys could remember huge amounts of text is because it was sticky in that fashion. And these days, the few people that exist in our society who are able on, you know, on the drop of a, a hand onto the table uh, mm. to recite a huge body of text, those would be rappers, mm. right? So a rapper, particularly say a battle rapper, and those are becoming more rare these days, but those guys can just recite hours and hours and hours of quite complex uh speech rising ideas uh, mm. puns uh disses uh insults uh stories all sorts of things right because they've got them in that in that form uh, i'm trying to think mm. can you think of any other groups of people who can do that and in modern society i would think uh, they, they, we are they're quite scarce i think that, as i said that, that medium that reason yeah, comedians. That, uh, that medium has faded yes comedians is another one I don't know if you mm. even said comedian then, but that came out. But comedians are also mm. able to 
do that. Mm. Uh, and you'll notice if you watch a good comedian, there is a great deal of rhyme, not rhyme, there's a great deal of rhythm in the delivery mm. of a great comedian. Mm. And I see a uh, uh, clockwork ZA in the comments says uh, the job of the bard in ancient society arose from the fact that songs made it easier to remember history and myth. Absolutely. And to spread propaganda. <laughs> 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 That's also true. Sideliner opinion says songs from childhood and youth sticks in your memory forever. They revive good memories uh, of good feelings. Oh, absolutely. I think um, some of the first songs that you hear when you're a small child, if they're imbued with positive emotion, they're going to stick with you until the day you die. I think that's I was just, just on a walk with my son, and he was literally my son. He's 11, and he's going, "Do you get nostalgic for anything, Dada?" And I was like, "I do my best not to. I think nostalgia can be uh, dangerous." My uncle died of nostalgia, um, you know, uh, and drink. But uh, you, if you spend too much time in it, in this beautiful imagined past, it can be tricky, you know. I was, yeah. I mean, my son have these stupidly deep conversations. He's like, well, the thing is, Dad, he goes, I've been getting really nostalgic lately for these songs. And the song, <laughs> there were the songs that used to be in uh, some YouTuber he used to watch, and it was like his theme song. And he's recently found out that's an actual musician, and he has other songs. And he says, and he's just talking about that, about that, that sweet, 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 uh, all-encompassing uh, time travel feeling. <laughs> going back to that version of you that didn't have all the problems that you have now and so on and so forth and mm. i said yeah that's dangerous you should listen to some new songs it makes <laughs> new pathways oh uh, man it's it's nice that you have these types of conversations of your son as well that you can have uh you can explore some of these ideas it's the it's the human experience you can pretty much tell him these things are just going to get more complex as you get older but it's also something you can you can look forward to as your your body of knowledge or your database of of experiences keeps growing yeah you just you know it's one of these things you have to accept yeah. some people never accept it some people you know but the the complexity uh will only increase and the the suffering will only increase but what also can increase if you choose is your capacity to deal with all of it mm. you know? i mean well that's a that's a theme that permeates your music from uh from uh, from start to finish especially your your more stoic albums the marcus aurelius albums mm. um but if you on that note if you were to look at your body of music that you've created so far specifically the the meaning wave chapter would you say there are particular philosophies that stand out as these form kind of like the bedrock or the, the foundation of, of that uh, of that creative endeavor of yours? As in schools of philosophy? As in specific? Yeah, just in, like, like uh, or uh, the stoicism of Marcus Aurelius or the, the clean your room of Jordan Peterson or whatever you want to call it. Well, I mean, there's a lot. We've investigated a mm. great many. Uh, and this is the point. The point is, and Alan Watts says this uh, on one of the songs is, you know, that no one school of thought has all the answers and no one individual has all the answers. What we need is the fullness of the view from these multiple point of views. I always thought of it like what we were what we were investigating, uh, I think of as a kind of orb. And uh, David Goggins is over there and he can see the orb from his specific vantage point, And he's really studied that that aspect, right? That's his vantage point. Uh, Jocko's over there, you know. Um, Manly P. Hall is over there, whoever it is, right? And uh, between all of them, we can have this fullness and we can take what is useful to us at that moment when we need it. Uh, there's another song about Alan Watts talks about how he was approached. Um, I said another song. I put it into a song. <laughs> he said it in a, in a conversation. Uh, he was approached by the powers that be of the time who informed him that they were able now to start sort of uh, breeding people very specifically and sort of genetically modifying humans and what have you. And what sort? And they were asking him what sort of people and what sort of traits they should be focusing on as they were breeding mm -hmm. this new kind of human. And he laughed, you know, as he does. <laughs> and... Uh, and he told them that they were very, very silly because uh, the sort of person you might need next week could be very different to the sort of person you need this time in six weeks. And then something's going to occur in 12 years. And if you got rid of that kind of a person and you suddenly need that kind of a person and so on and so forth, um, you know, and it's the same with philosophies. And what mm. I think about philosophies is operating systems, right? So you pick an operating system with which to navigate this realm of tears and you pick one that works for you. But it's not necessarily the case that the same one is going to always work. 
you know, uh, things change very, very rapidly and uh, radically, as we've uh, observed in our own lifetimes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so you know, what we do, well, what I'm doing here is trying to give us all the tools, as ma- as many of the tools as we can, and make them understandable and easily usable in that way that Neo in the Matrix would plug it the back of his head into that machine, and then he would go, blah, 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 I know Kung Fu. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that that kind of relates to something that you and Dylan Ghost talked about. Uh, you specifically, uh, uh, you, you summed it up in program or be programmed. And mm. I mean, that's kind of what you're doing through your music is you're doing programming to a certain extent, especially mm. if you think about how a lot of people listen to music. They often listen to music while they're doing something else, while they're washing the dishes or while they're jogging or while they're doing woodwork or whatever. It's something in the background, but your brain still, your unconscious mind still notices it, even if you're not actively focusing on the lyrics or what you're listening to. Your subconscious is paying full attention. Your subconscious doesn't give a fuck about the washing up. Hmm. It knows how to do the washing up. It's done that a thousand times. So you've got to think about it. your subconscious is just sat there like, you know, looking for some input, which it's then going to turn into your life. Um, and it will take it from the seemingly the less obvious aspect of, of maybe what you're doing, uh, which mm-hmm. would be the music. So people get all confused as to why their lives are a mess when they listen to these, you know, miserable pop songs or what have you. Why can't I find a boyfriend when all I listen to is songs about heartbreak mm-hmm. and so on and so forth, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, that's what one's doing. One is uh, communicating to the subconscious because the subconscious does most of the stuff. Hmm. and um yeah that if you just could uh, also explain to my audience that idea of program or deprogram uh, uh, program or be programmed it's it kind of sounds like you you don't really have a choice here you're either going to have a uh, have some control over what your unconscious mind consumes or you that it's going to come from somewhere else it's almost like that quote from uh Carl Jung that says if you don't know who you are then the world's going to tell you well if you're not programming yourself then the world is going to program you this is exactly that. The world will ask you who you are, and if you do not know, it will tell you. But this is the same as the devil will find work for idle hands to do, hmm. right? This is in every, that's what I was saying, you know, with, with any specific philosophy. The most important things, that's what you find, is the most important things will be in all the philosophies, and the most important hmm. things will be in all the religions. Uh, hmm. And that's one of the important things. It pops up in everything. The idea that as an individual, if you are not actively guiding this ship, something else will right Mm -hmm. or worst case scenario will crash but you know something is going to occupy this space something is going to come in i remember my grandma you know she used to talk about uh you know that's why they call booze spirits because when you get out of your head uh, out of your head uh spirits then joyride your body and take Mm -hmm. over and run amok with you right and she really believed that and then you know i went out and lived in the world and i was like yeah i suppose that does make sense i can (laughs) observe that's been the case you know, I mean, you wake yeah. up, black, you wake up blackout drunk in a skip, and he's like, "Well, who put me there? It must have been that that weird ass demon that took over my personage." And you see this with individuals, individuals who are not actively paying attention to themselves and actively directing themselves, uh, become vessels for other forces, whether those forces are, you know, political or ideological or cosmic or or um, multi, whatever the heck it is. Something is going to use this because this is a fucking supercomputer locked to an incredible Gundam suit like <laughs> this thing here is incredible right and there's millions of these all over the place it'd be like if you left uh you know like a really really good scooter with a gun turret and all that just like left it on the side of the road someone's going to take that scooter with the gun turret and they're going to run around and like maybe you were just going to use the gun turret to I don't know shoot bird shot or something but someone's going to take that thing and go down the shopping center and get mm. revenge on uh on the cashier or so you know what I mean like mm. These things are incredible and can do almost anything, right? So if you're not actively uh, deciding what is going on with this thing at all times, at all times, because any second you you leave the thing at the side of the road where you go to the shop, someone will do something with it, hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. But it's also the, I think what's having an effect on all of us is the fact that it is the ideas that permeate the world around you. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, um, the modern world is not materialist because every book is about the virtues of materialism. It's because every book is soaked in materialist assumptions, but not explicitly. It's just there in the background. There you go. I mean, this is exactly it. 
Yeah, but it's the same with many of the ideas of our time. It's just all the media we're consuming is soaked in all of these uh, ideas of our time in the background, and that has an effect on you. Yeah, I've got one in the background right now, right? This idea mm. of space as it mm. is, this <laughs> assumption. This is an assumption, right? I don't know this to be the case, personally. I'm assuming this is the case. And uh, mm. much of much of that is... Um, <laughs> yeah right but what do you do you have to take some things uh so you, you know you it's that's where madness comes in right it's the i think about this quite a lot it's like you know um not surrendering fully to belief uh because belief can become a prison but then you don't want to be so uh vague that nothing at all is real in uh that level that drives people to utter insanity and makes them unable to do anything at all hmm. Yeah, well, and, the, and on the other side as well, as we as we touched on earlier, uh, at every moment you're absorbing ideas, at every moment you're observe, uh, absorbing uh, the, the philosophies of your time, whether that be uh, through the music that you're listening while you're driving to work or uh, the background, uh, whatever is happening in the background that you're not particularly paying attention to, but uh, some parts of your brain and mind are. Um, or even just the, as we said earlier, the assumptions within some of the dialogue in the movies that you watch, that's not even sometimes explicit. Yeah. So, you know, how much of what you think you think is you, mm. how much of what you say is your speech? Or are you just regurgitating something you heard someone else say or saw someone else say that looked cool? Uh, how much of what you believe is, is based upon you having thought that through to its logical conclusion yourself and therefore consider uh, found it to be correct or how much of it is just assumptions based on what everybody else did and then how many those assumptions based on what everybody else did how much of that was them going through those processes and not and how far back does this go and how much of our uh, foundational assumptions are faulty nonsense and how much of them are, are creepy stuff that was put there deliberately to ensnare us and so on and so forth so mm. you know, all of this stuff is worth considering. I would say a great deal of unnecessary suffering is a direct result of people not having thought things all the way through properly. Mm. Yeah. But also, as you said, uh, not having full control over what occupies their mind or what uh, it's almost like a sausage machine. What are you putting in there that's actually uh, forming the inside of the sausage? You have control over what you're feeding into the machine, and that's going to affect what the product is that comes out the other side. Mm. Nice sausage visual metaphor there. Everybody <laughs> visualize a sausage being constructed. But it's true. It's very true. And, uh, you know, how much of it is, is parasites? You know, I was telling my mm. son about cat parasites, which uh, mm. work through cats, but to their own ends on humans, mm. right? You know about these things. And mm, uh, there's an awful lot of that. <laughs> absolutely. We were right. Cat parasites. Yo, <laughs> this shit is real. So you basically, the thing is, you really do need to be paying attention. That's the, the number one mm. rule. See, and it's it's a not just on not just once a year, not just every now and again. You need to be constantly checking in. I find this. I do. I have the. I do habit audits. I audit my mm. habits to see if you know I have any new ones. If the ones I have are still doing what I wanted them to be doing, because useful habits are uh, useful. Bad habits mm. are you know duh. Um, mm. All a habit is is um, you know that's. Uh, that's just something you do all the time. And that could be your discipline, right? I go to the gym every day or whatever. That's a habit. That's a useful habit. That's a habit that I've deliberately engineered to carry me to my aim, right? But I have to check in very regularly on a monthly, but I do little mini ones like weekly, just to have a quick look. Uh, and these new habits are always coming in and they're usually destructive. And usually somehow they, there's someone else's idea of what might be good or something, you know, and you have to find these things and then turn them into something useful. And you have to constantly be doing that. Uh, constant mm -hmm. vigilance is the price of freedom uh, on a micro and a macro scale. Hmm. But how do you do a, a habit audit if sometimes, especially with bad habits, you actually need someone else, an external voice to tell you or a, a third person to tell you you have this bad habit? Often, uh, I think from a personal perspective, you can be blind to some of your bad habits, particularly. How do you separate, uh, create enough separation where you can actually look at, do an audit as you, you the term that you use on your bad and good habits? Uh, well, separation is a very important thing. And you want to be uh, maintaining that as much as possible. So, again, that comes down to another constant reminder of things like, you know, you are not 
your thoughts, you are that which observes them, right? Mm -hmm. And a thought could come in. People confuse themselves with the, like, the, oh, I am, you know, speaking with my son about this when, when he's younger. He would think that a thought would be him. And that mean if he had a bad thought, he was bad. It's like, no, you can let that thing come in. It's like a like a paper, like a plastic bag on a windy day, and you can float in and you can let it float away. You don't have to hang on to it. It's not it's not a part of you. Uh, and it's the same with uh, emotion. You know, uh, you are not you are not your emotions. You're that which observes those emotions, if you so wish. So I do a little thing, like for example, I do this uh, hand thing. I do this like not very good Vulcan thing which i taught myself wandering around new york in 2004 yeah. and i sort of flex on that and that roots me to my physicality which reminds me of uh which helps to return me to to that state and not sort of uh it's very easy for a human being to sort of go you know tunneling off down uh into the future into these imagined catastrophic catastrophic futures or reimagine past or whatever it is right so i do this thing which helps to bring me into the moment and this also helps to remind me of that i i am awareness of all these things rather than the things themselves and so that's a very long ass way of getting to the point that you do this with say your habit auditing you have to become detached and you just go purely what did i do on these days oh i'm doing that oh i'm playing this video game for 45 minutes oh i'm whatever it is right mm. oh i'm whatever these things so you just in a very detached fashion you just list them and then you go okay is this useful to me what am i and it's if you've got aims that are very specific that you've reverse engineered in such a fashion that certain things will get you to those aims it's, it's a lot easier to go okay is this thing going to get in the way of that you know mm. and if you're non-negotiable with that stuff so okay i just don't do this thing i don't do that because that's not getting me to that place so that's the thing i don't do so if you can be in a combination, uh, you know, uh, somewhat disassociated and you have your non-negotiable aspects tied to your aims, then it's a lot easier. Hmm. But uh, when it comes to positive or, uh, you know, positive habits, I think that's absolutely something that people should focus on is to accumulate those positive habits. But in your personal experience, what are some of those key positive habits that through your habit audits that you've realized form uh, an integral part of your day and that you would actually recommend to, to other people if they haven't already adopted these habits? Uh, exercise, <laughs> which is the last mm -hmm. one. I didn't, I didn't really do much of that until I was like 41, you know, it was always the last thing. It was like, oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. So I'd, 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 int I'd got a lot of stuff integrated. I'd fixed a lot of my issues and things that were causing problems and what have you. But that one I still hadn't got in until, um, until I came to Mexico. Uh, yeah. And that's the most, I think that's probably the most important. That's made the biggest difference in everything. So like, you know, this working, um, being fit and strong and healthy uh changes everything uh obviously you know it makes your thinking clearer it makes you uh much better much more able to uh act in pretty much any aspect of society uh it makes you more confident it makes you more able to be useful in a sort of practical fashion um it's a it's a direct embodiment of a kind of discipline that maybe you're enacting in other aspects of your life you're doing the work you're supposed to be doing or you're um you know whatever it is you're writing what you're supposed to be writing or drawing what you're supposed to be drawing or whatever it is uh it makes all those things a lot easier because it's a sort of physical manifestation of something that was otherwise uh you know somewhat uh cosmic and sort of whimsical mm -hmm. Um, well, I have some of my my clearest thoughts after I've had exercise or, or done some exercise. It's almost as if the the fresh blood th flow through your brain just clears out all those cobwebs, and you can think clearly. Um, and I mean, that's that's my experience, and that's why I would also endorse completely the the fact that you need to exercise, even in, in your own humble capacity, even if you only have a little bit of time to do it per day or a, a few times per week. That's still better than nothing. And the the best day to start was yesterday, but the mm -hmm. second best start uh, day to start is today. Yeah, uh, it's really powerful for one. one something that's really really necessary in various aspects of uh, existence is being in the moment. As we mentioned, touched on a bit earlier, the, you know, uh, 
not being in the moment often causes lots of problems in the imagined uh, catastrophic future or the recreated you know, beautiful past or whatever it is. Anytime you're not in the moment, well, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing for a start, which is no yeah. good. And something that uh, exercise does is pour, drag you into that moment. Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever felt as close to God, which is another way of thinking about the moment, as in a really deep squat, uh, holding something really heavy. You're not, there's nothing, no past or future concerns can invade that moment. That's as close to the source as uh, I think you can be. Uh, and certainly without stimulants. And what you also discover if you do lots of, get into doing lots of exercises, lots of stuff that you thought you needed drugs for, you don't need drugs for. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I remembered the other day, uh, I had to run very far, very fast one time when I was in London. Um, very far and very fast from, um, from, what was it, Dalston all the way down to Brick Lane, which is, I don't know. I used to have to get a bus. I used to get a bus that distance. It's a distance you would get a bus for, right? I ran it very fast. And I got to the other side, and I had this incredible sensation. I realized the sensation was almost identical to when um, I'd been to see uh, this uh, DJ duo in Ghent, Belgium. And uh, they had recently bought a scooter. And in the hubcap of the scooter was a bag of pills. And that scooter had been in a garage since 1993. So these were pills from 1993. And I realized the sensation I had, this all over incredible sensation from doing that run was pretty much identical to those 1993 pills, which we all thought were so great. And then I had all these other experiences in life, which led me to the realization that pretty much all of the things that one does drugs to achieve, one can achieve via other means uh, that are somewhat less destructive. Um, mm. Did you see that video of Jocko uh, seeing the double rainbow the other day? No. It's beautiful. It's Jocko. He's uh, Jocko Willink, mm -hmm. uh, ex Navy SEAL, uh, powerful, disciplined person. Uh, he's found a rainbow and he's videoing himself going, It's a double rainbow. But what's funny is he looks like a sort of gurning rave of pill head, except <laughs> he's just sh everything is pure and he's healthy and he's glowing. He doesn't have that green, sort of rotting, uh, maggoty zombie aspect that when you're watching videos of guys like chewing loads of pills at raves in like the 90s, mm -hmm. right? It's like he is on discipline. He's <laughs> out of his mind on discipline. He's he's injecting he's, discipline right into his veins, mainlining that. He is, and it's real. It's, but it's funny. But it's real. It's a real thing. Uh, mm. So all of that stuff that you liked when you were a teenager, what have you, or if you're a teenager now, and there's all these you know, things that seem attractive to you, these are things that are available in other ways, and they're ways that will not kill you and destroy your soul and turn you into a retard. You know. mm. yeah well it's like i said uh, it's one of those good habits that i can only i uh, can highly recommend to anyone it's and i think something that's important that people need to understand is that starting to exercise doesn't mean that now you have to become a gym junkie and have to be in the gym every day and you have to exercise 10 hours a day otherwise you're not going to get that effect you you start with you do what you can with what you have the time that you have the the opportunities or the money that you have what can you do with that that, that which you have um but I also to, to say something the other day sorry mm. um to cut you off there that was rude i took your stuff no uh, go for it but dan go said something which i thought was very which was um concise which is you want to be uh so healthy that big farmer can't make money off you <laughs> you know it's one way of thinking about it right you know what i mean like and another way of thinking about it is like you want to be uh able to uh support yourself and those around you and not be a burden uh mm -hmm. on the world around you unnecessarily right uh mm -hmm. you want to be you want to be all you can be in every aspect of your being all right and the, uh, the physical one is that that really comes first you know, that's the foundation. Or that should be the foundation upon which the other ones are built. And oftentimes we do it backwards. Um. Hmm. So when it comes to uh, something that I wanted to ask uh, specifically in regards to the subject matter of your songs, the people whose speeches you sample, how privileged have you been in regards to meeting some of these people? I mean, some of them, unfortunately, are deceased, but some of mm. them walk among us still. Some of them are still here. Um, how many of them have you been able to encounter and what was that like? 
Uh, I think I had a number of them, and it's they're always lovely. Mm. Yeah, um, you can see some of those. I did a couple of podcasts with Jordan B. Peterson. Mm. No, I've example, listened to them; they're brilliant, which were lovely. Um, the second one was really lovely because he was just, you know, he was just coming out of um, being ill. Mm. Is one way of putting it, you know, going through the underworld for that period that he did, and he was very raw. And it was really lovely because, uh, you know, he re he the, he really, like, obviously really loved what uh, the music had been done with the music. Mm -hmm. And they really loved the reaction to it. Uh, and he was specifically loved when we did that second um, conversation, the uh, comments. He was, mm -hmm. he was blown away. So blown away, he spoke about it on about five different podcasts. He's, like, very used to, you know, YouTube comment sections being right. uh, horrible dens of, uh, of misery and awfulness. And in the meaning way of Akira the Dawn chat bit, he just saw beauty and gratitude and hope and light and all the things that you would like to see. He was very moved by this. And, and that was very sweet. Uh, hmm. So yeah, anyway, it was, it's uh, uh, Naval is great. No, he's uh, very, uh, what would be the right word? He's very positive. Uh, he's been, you know, he's shared the stuff. He's, he really likes it. Mm. Uh, he's grateful for it. He sees the utility in it. He, uh, and, you know, he's been someone who's been very helpful in my own, um, you know, development and fixing mm. various bad programming I had from records and people when I was little. Mm. Yeah. Um, I had a really nice message off Norm MacDonald, who's now. Mm. Oh, that's special. Yeah. Which was one of the more special things, because I asked him for his um, permission to make some music, and uh, he wrote to me and said that he would be honoured, which is a lovely mm. thing to say. And uh, he said he would be honoured, and he said, uh, "You strike me as my favourite kind of person, a free man," <laughs> which was a very, very beautiful thing. And um, mm. yeah, you know, so it's what's what's been what's been wonderful is uh, everyone I have encountered uh, has been. They say never meet your heroes or whatever, right? Or hmm. uh, anyone I've encountered. Never meet your samples that you use in your never music. Never meet your samples, exactly. <laughs> never meet your samples. And all the ones I've met have been lovely. And all the ones I've had communications with uh, have been lovely. Uh, mm -hmm. As one would expect, as one would hope. Uh, you know, there's always a danger in doing this is that, that you pick someone who's actually, e you know, an evil breezard of some kind. You know what I mean? Uh, I have been fortunate and um, well aimed enough to not have that happen. There is nothing mm -hmm. I regret. There is no voice that I would change. You know. Mm. Now that's a that's a special privilege when you get to meet some of those individuals that have provided all this this great content that you could create something new with, and to hear that they also appreciate it and that they mm. also enjoy the the creations that you've made. I mean that's that's just on a different level that I can't imagine the 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 feeling of someone or already someone taking something you created, creating something new out of it. And you also uh, appreciating that new creation. It's a it's an amazing thing. And hopefully yeah. that process can continue. Maybe someone can take some of your creations turned into something new, com completely, uh, completely different, maybe in a different medium. There's so much room for error. It's mm. so easy. For, like. I mean, it would be so easy for it to be awful and for you to hate it, right? Someone comes along and they Absolutely. take what you said and turn just the idea. Someone takes what you said and turn it into a song. Almost sounds it sounds like, like mockery and ridiculous. It sounds like the thing that would uh, that one would dislike. It would be difficult for something like that to actually be uh, worthwhile and good, let alone great. So, uh, mm. yeah, it's a strange. It's a strange endeavor that I've found myself involved in it when mm. one looks at it from from all sorts of angles mm. but on that note of uh, different creative mediums outside of music are there any other ways that you express yourself creatively uh in the in the world out there well i mean i do all the associated stuff i do the videos mm. uh i do the artwork uh i do the design and the i mean pretty much everything uh connected to it uh mm. I do. 
uh, I do live shows every night on the internet. Um, you know, I, yeah, I do a lot. Um, and, but yeah, so a lot of the things I love, I get to do as part of this. Like I said, when I was very little, I, you know, I was, I loved comic books and anime and music and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And what I've ended up doing is creating some way that I can bring all the things that I love together in one place. Mm -hmm. Uh, the books I used to love, the stories I used to love, the philosophy that I used to love, not even realizing that's what it was. I found a way to bring together all the things that, uh, you know, move me and excite me, uh, into one thing. And now you move other people with that, with those creations. Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's the oh. thing to do, right? I mean, that, that's, I think there was a Naval bit where he said you base something along the lines of, uh, I've paraphrased it, but you basically want to find the thing that you wish existed and make that exist. Hmm. Right. And then there's your product or there's your thing to do or reason for being or what have you find the mm. thing that you wish existed and make that exist make first some you know first you're gonna have to turn yourself into the sort of person that could do that so maybe you have to acquire the skills or something and maybe that's mm. going to take a while but if that's what if you do that uh that can only be worthwhile and it can only be successful worst case mm. scenario is you end up doing the thing you love and and i don't know it's not that successful but you're still doing the thing you love I mean, yeah, it's, it's and Mario, you're doing the thing you love, and and you, you find all the other people who love it, and it's wonderful. Yeah. Right. No, there's there's something deeply satisfying just through creation itself. But you also, mm. I firmly believe, you have to share what you've created. You can't. It's like the parable of the talents. You can't just keep it here to yourself, bury it underground. You have to share your talents with the world, and the, it doesn't mean you have to upload it online so everyone can see. But share it with your family, your friends, with people that are special to you. Your creativity is meant to be shared well that's the thing right we're all individuals but we're all simultaneously networked and both those aspects are very very important and when any one of those aspects gets quashed too much that's when you end up in sort of some tyrannical situation if mm. you start crushing down the individual uh that becomes a problem but at the same time if you start elevating the individual too much and not giving a fuck about the network aspect and your, the society you're in that creates problems so therefore in an endeavor if one is expressing one the the ultimate potential of one's individual aspect in a fashion that uh connects with the network in a useful fashion that would be the optimal way of uh existing in this specific realm i suspect Hmm. And we've got a comment here, a question from the chat. Clockwork ZA asks, or first says, love your work, Akira. And then he asks, can we expect Chesterton wave or more Jung meaning wave sometime? Uh, you know, I don't like to let, let, let people know what, what's going on. So they have nice surprises. Uh, so expect some nice surprises. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, the next thing is a, an L Nightingale record. And uh, which will be swiftly followed in March by Meditations Volume 2 with Marcus Aurelius, both of which are complete. Mm -hmm. So that's the next uh, sort of eight weeks. Yeah. And this uh, this creative impulse, do you are you guided by what's happening in your life currently? Or do you have a bit more of a structure in regards to what particular things you want to achieve in a year or within a specific time frame? How do you how do you plan the future on the on the topic of, of talking about what's on the horizon? Well, uh, the idea is um, uh, how did Goggins put it? Goggins talked about, you know, outworking the chart, the idea of God having this book and it's got all your potential in it. And then you get up there and he's like, whoa, I did not expect this. Holy shit. Um, something like that, right? So if you're if you're aiming at maximizing um, your potential in this lifetime, then there's going to be a bunch of stuff you're going to need to be able to do to get there. So I have this uh, sort of rough outline that involves learning. It's each record I make, I'm learning something essentially. Right. Mm. I'm brainwashing myself. I'm integrating something into myself that I need. So I have a kind of roadmap of things to get towards. Uh, and then along the way, I will encounter issues. Right. And I'll be like, OK, so I need this. So this is the I need to do this record. This was not necessarily planned. I had all these records planned, but this we need this right now. So let's do this right now. 
So it's a combination of I have, you know, years and years and years and years sort of mapped out uh, in potentiality, but also leaving enough room for inspiration and necessity at the same mm. time. But uh, looking at your catalog and looking at uh, how often you live stream and all the content you're creating, your your petrol tank seems pretty full if you were a vehicle. It seems like you have endless drive of creativity and productivity. But what would your advice then be to people that hit that rut where they, they people that know they're creative, but they just they can't at the moment get that drive. Their petrol tank is a bit empty. What do you do when you get in that type of situation? I mean, I've not been in that type of situation, so... Mm. I've only, and you know, no matter what was happening, no matter how unsuccessful or how many uh, roadblocks, uh, whether I was homeless at the time, whatever was going on, I always kept moving and was, mm. did not stop, uh, no matter what was going on. You know, we had our 500th stream on Saturday and we rewatched some of the older ones and whether I was getting, uh, you know, whether I was on a road trip moving to from LA to Texas, whether I'd just been kicked out of my studio, whether uh, I'd just been locked out of the country and exiled to Mexico, whatever it is, I never stopped. I kept moving. So I would say the thing is to have a thing that you, to, to be doing something that you would just do regardless, right? No matter what was going on. And to, and to recognize the, uh, the importance of whatever it is you're doing right whatever it is you're doing is important because you are important so if you found a thing that is the thing for you to be doing that thing is important because you're here for a reason you're crucial every one of you is crucial and uh without you operating at maximum at your fullest light shining the rest of us suffer and the overall picture suffers I, I think I'd talk about I, I think about like, you know, you have a screen, one dead pixel on the screen will fuck up the movie for everybody, right? <laughs> Once you notice that. So it's like everyone has to be operating on maximal, every one of us pixels on maximal. So you want to find the thing that is the thing that you would do regardless, right? Mm. And then the trick is to keep doing that thing. You want to get into the zone of that thing. And what I discovered in 2018 was that it is possible to get into the zone of something and then just stay there. Because I've seen people be in the zone and then not be able to get back. I'd seen these great musicians make a wonderful first album. Then they, then their patterns are disrupted. Their habits are disrupted. They're mm -hmm. cast out of the zone. They go on tour. They get into cocaine, whatever it is. And then they're unable to get back to that space they were in to make the great second record. Right? But simultaneously, I'd seen people who'd stayed in the zone and they just kept being great. I was like, okay, so you can keep being great. Uh, that is possible. So you want to find the thing that is the thing you would do regardless and then remain in the zone of that thing and then momentum will take over, right? And momentum mm. only works uh, in one direction. It doesn't flatline. It doesn't go sort of sideways like a crab. It goes forward or back, right? Uh, and you have control over that. Uh, so you want to find that thing, get in the zone of that thing, and then that momentum will propel you forward forever if you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and do not stray from the path hmm. well i think that's uh that's uh, the ideal to strive towards i mean that's something that i also take great pleasure in is when you just see someone in the zone whether that be an athlete or a musician mm. or a it's just something innate in you is you it, it's pleasurable to see someone in the zone being great at what they do it's i don't know maybe it's if it's part of just being human or some people uh, don't have this experience but it's it's a great experience to see people being great at what they do producing something like art or producing something that you can see maybe you have no talent in that and they're my uh uh, credentials for living in south africa just to got proven so we got a rolling blackout there um <laughs> But uh, it should work still the the uh, internet for a while. But as I was saying, even just seeing someone in being in the zone, it, it's nice to see. And I mean, being in the zone is incomparable. That's on a different level when you are there yourself. But I don't know what some of your thoughts are on that as well. Where that? Why do we like also experiencing someone else? being in the zone why why do we have this innate feeling of we want to encourage them or, or uh, see them go further well it's multiple reasons uh one of it, it you know it reminds us of the greatness that is within us right 
So if you see something in someone else you admire, that's in you as well. And you know that. And that's why you admire it, because uh, you admire the best in yourself. Uh, it reminds, it connects you with that sort of transcendent glory that humanity is capable of. And uh, when you see that, when you see someone doing something incredible, right? And simultaneously, you know, you, that's how someone who, who has lost their humanity is someone who cannot take any pleasure in greatness, right? A society that cannot take pleasure in greatness and beauty and that crushes those things is one that is doomed, um, mm. you know. So well, that, is... that, that kind of relates perfectly to uh, uh, my previous episode on my channel. I was talking to a guest about the, the inability of many of our writers today of being unable to write heroes. They can't write <laughs> real heroes. George R. R. Martin. <laughs> <coughs> Nihilist Fafel. Everyone, everyone just has to be this flawed mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's horrendous, you know. And it's funny because I recently did this Ayn Rand uh, record. And, of course, she was the opposite. She just did these, like, sort of, like, pure heroes that were almost, like, un unrealistically pure. Because she wanted to give you something to, to aim at. You know, this. she felt that heroes should be something that one aspired to. She felt that, you know, she didn't like morally ambiguous characters hers were either very bad or very very great or what have you right mm -hmm. and um if you look in why people first loved superheroes it was a similar thing superman was something aspirational and wonderful and, and he represented that potential in all of us right and uh and that's why why you look you look to him and now this horrible you know what was that they put out that suicide squad video game the other week uh mm -hmm. in which the villains kill the heroes and it's all quite gross. The you know one of the villains like urinates on the hero once he's dead, mm -hmm. but it's presented in such a fashion that you're supposed to cheer for that and find that funny. Um, and the game bombed. They thought they were very smart and ha 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 and so on and so forth. But the game absolutely bombed. It's just like people really don't actually want that. Sometimes you're like ha ha. What if Skeletor won? That'd be funny, right? But you don't really want that. That's not mm -hmm. what you want. You want the uh, hero to win because you want to win right that's why those stories are the shape that they are because you want to believe that it's okay for you that's why we love a redemption story because we want to be redeemed we want to believe it's possible for us no matter we know the worst of what we are in a way that other people do not know every time we did something that was not the right thing to do every time we made the the weak decision or what have you we know all that our subconscious knows all that so we long for redemption and the, the contemporary storytellers who are doing the opposite of these very obvious things um, are uh, increasingly, you know, it's diminishing returns for these people. And they can't finish their stories. George R. R. Martin is the perfect example of this. George R. R. Martin is somebody who's like, you know, he stole his fucking middle initials from uh, a great man. You know what I mean? He stole that double R from Tolkien. And then he's like, oh, I'm going to show Tolkien. Yeah, I, I saw a thing the other day. You say that like Aragorn. Oh yeah, you know, but like, what was he going to do with all the baby orcs? Is he going to kill all the baby orcs? What about the cost of the grain or whatever the fuck it was? You know, so he's his story, his song of ice and fire, in which the everyone's morally gray, and if there is a hero, that guy dies because that's what would happen. Blah 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 blah. Mm. He's found himself in a position where he can't finish his story. Either he's unable to, because he's written himself into a dead end, or he doesn't care enough to. And if he doesn't care about his story, why the fuck should anybody else? Mm. Absolutely. And I mean, that was the the point uh, from my previous guest, Jay Burden, as well. He wrote an amazing piece called The Tyranny of Just, where we live mm. in a world where every, everyone just tells you you're just a man, or you're just a human, or you're just mm. a you're just a, a normal person. You can never be great, so you can never be a hero everything is just 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 and uh we see this in 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 media as well as you correctly pointed out you can't have a heroic figure he's just a flawed man you can't have a, a true mm. sacrifice it's just a, a pathetic self-centered action um mm. the best example that he used was what we see in the marvel movies where just as uh, a hero does something heroic it has to be undermined by a joke the, mm. the moment has to be ruined by uh, levity rather than basking in, in in that greatness just for a moment um but it it's it's this new phenomenon where uh, as he correctly puts it it's the tyranny of just yeah 
Yeah, very much so. Uh, and it's another thing Ayn Rand wrote uh, a book about that as well. Uh, yeah, it's an ugly thing. It's a, it's a weak thing. Um, it's unsustainable. Any society that adopts that as their credo will fail. And uh, and then great greatness is the only thing that can uh, transcend the rubble that that will create. So then you have another age of heroes. So an age of heroes is inevitable. Uh, it is um, unfortunate that we have to suffer through uh, the the miserable bleatings of these losers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but there is with regards to culture that we have so much greatness that was produced that we can enjoy now. You don't have to watch contemporary movies. There's so many incredible things that were created that you could be giving your attention to. Aside from the fact that you could be creating your own stuff if you were that way inclined, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah, I see in the in the chat, uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt sent us uh, a lot of new viewers here from his channel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wyatt. Uh, and uh, welcome to all the new uh, viewers that are just tuning in. <laughs> Bienvenidos. You've uh, you've got a lot of catching up to do. You can always watch the replay uh, afterwards. There's been a lot of uh, interesting discussion here. And but also to to add to that point, uh, when it comes to the the heroic, I think this is exactly the message that is often imbued in a lot of your songs as well, uh, Adam. And that's the idea that you as an individual can be heroic. You can be a hero. You, you're not just a man. You're not just a, a flawed being. You can actually be a hero in your own sense, in your own environment, in your own time. Yeah, well, you must. Mm. It's not even just that you can. It's that you must. It's crucial. I mean, as I was saying earlier, uh, each individual that does not realize their potential leaves something missing in the cosmos there is something that was supposed to be there that is not there this means the picture is incomplete the masterpiece is unfinished uh in some ways you know i wouldn't say it's ruined but like the greatness in you is necessary uh for 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 you and for everybody else i always used to say when i was little and i didn't really know why i was saying it until later i used to say only you can save mankind only you can save mankind which i think i must have heard in like some sci-fi thing or something <laughs> but it was that it was it was that only you can save mankind. You can't be waiting for somebody else to do it. It's you. It's up to you, right? And that that and once you apply that, uh, things get a lot easier and a lot more beautiful and uh, fizzy and effervescent. Well, I think we're in the position that we are because millions and millions of people have just said or just started waiting for someone smarter, bigger, stronger, uh, more experienced, more influential to to step up. Everyone's waiting for everyone, uh, someone else that's that's more great than them to uh, to make a difference. And when when millions or even billions of people start doing it, you just have this passivity. Everyone's just sitting around waiting for that night on the in shining armor on the horizon, and he, and he doesn't arrive. Yeah, this goes back to what we were saying earlier. This why like exercise is great because mm. uh, it's hard to feel heroic, I guess, if you're like overweight or too skinny or skinny fat or sick or ill or just like kind of carbohydrate poisoned like so many people are right it's harder to imagine that heroic aspect of yourself uh if you're fit it's a lot easier uh because you you look relatively heroic compared to a lot mm -hmm. of people it's just uh and that you know it's not you don't have to do that but that's an easier way of doing it and uh you know the sort of cynical conspiratorial mind it would make sense that they've gone out of their way to make people as sort of unhealthy and miserable and mm -hmm. sick as possible Hmm. I see a Colonel Chris Wyatt says, I'm not waiting, I step forward always. Well, that sounds oh. like something you'd say, well, my guest would say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, wait for what? Wait for hmm. what? It's like, oh, I'm going to wait to uh, have the adventure of my life. I'm going to wait for everything to become hyper real and glorious. Uh, I'm going to sit around and, uh, and, and rot. What are we, why? Okay. Well, I'll do this. I'll do this thing when the time is right. I'll, I'll I'll do this when the time is right, and you just keep postponing, and it's never the right time to start yeah. a family, to buy a house, or to to take on a new responsibility, to do something that takes your life to the next level. Oh, exactly. I mean, this was the way we were, me and my wife, in the early days. We were like, oh yeah, we, you know, it's not the time time to have a kid yet because we don't have enough money or da 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 da. And um, then Hercules happened, um, on, in an unplanned fashion. And forced me, certainly, to up my game in so many aspects. 
uh, and fix my relationship with money and sort out my discipline and all these various things and to become a much greater version of myself that I otherwise maybe would not have done. You know, nothing will motivate you towards that greatness uh, like children, you know, mm. like because it's responsibility, right? It's like picking up the rock. It's like picking up the heaviest thing you can find, as Dr. Peterson talks about, like taking on some kind of responsibility will force you into a uh, into that heroism, will force you into that greatness, just taking on mm -hmm. the uh, the challenge. Any challenge, just pick, a fuck, pick up something heavy and get after it. Mm -hmm. Get after it. So, Mr. Kira the Don, my, uh, this has been a fascinating, fascinating conversation, but my last question to you is on the on the theme of program or de -pro be programmed mm. um if i i want to give you the opportunity to program my audience for the the week ahead uh, implant an idea in their mind it can be anything it can be a small little sentence and it can be a rhetorical question it can be anything but if you could leave them with something to just keep at the back of the mi their mind to chew on this week what would it be Oh, well, I was just thinking we mentioned this earlier about thinking about that the greatness you admire in others is in you Right. So if you think about something, something you've admired in someone else, right? So, oh, that person, whatever, I like the way that person dressed, or oh, I like the way that person spoke to me, or whatever it was, that's in you. And if you've not yet noticed or bought out the aspect, that is an opportunity for you to do that. So do that. Think on that, that the greatness you admire in others is in you. It definitely, definitely is. It's not a case that, you know, sometimes people get upset or, or uh, distraught or anxious witnessing greatness in others because they think that's not in them. But it's the inverse is the case. It's the truth that it is in you. And maybe you just haven't noticed yet or maybe you just haven't found out how to bring it out. So I would say mm -hmm. try that. I think that's a perfect... Uh... Listen, to meaning wave. listen to lots of meaning wave. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's the that's the perfect place to end it. I think that's a, a great thought to to keep at the back of your mind. A little program uh, there for you. There's your programming for the week, um, Mister Kira the Don. Where can people find you if they are new to your music? They haven't heard it yet. Where's the best places they can find your incredibly vast catalog of content? Uh, Meaningwave.com and anywhere you happen to be there should be something for you. If you like to hang around on Spotify, the music's on Spotify. If you're a YouTube person, it's there. Uh, wherever it is that you happen to be, there should be some, we should have some lemonade stand out there for you. So yeah, yeah. No, Akira the Dawn, Meaning Wave, you will find something that will be yeah. useful. In your and then life. for all of you uh, that are too lazy to type, there is a link to all of that in the description of the stream. <laughs> so uh, after, this, after this, you can go check it out. There's going to be something for everyone. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, everything you need, I think, uh, should be there in the description. Um, mm. Then the last thank you as well to everyone that tuned in. Thank you for your comments and for your questions. I love adding them as well to the content. You are now part of the time capsule episode. So if people, that's one of the things that I try to do with this channel as well, that if someone, if the internet and YouTube survives in 100 years, people can come back. They can listen to this episode. What were people talking about in 2024? What were the, the thoughts at the forefront of their minds? And the, all of your comments as well are part of that time capsule product. So thank you very much for tuning in and again thank you for uh to colonel chris wyatt for sending some of your audience over to this side as well if you're new to this channel you can also leave a like and uh, you can subscribe for more content like this and uh, like i said my great guest uh, has a massive catalog of content so that's going to keep you busy uh, for the rest of the week at least and uh, probably hook you <laughs> for the for the foreseeable future but uh, Mr. Akira Ladon, thank you once again for all of your great insights and thank you for chatting with us here tonight. Yeah, thank you, brother. Hmm. And I hope everyone has a, a great week. Stay safe, stay thinking, and think about some of those th final thoughts that uh, my guest left you with here. Program or be programmed. And I hope you all have a great rest of the evening, rest of the week. Cheers, guys. Have a good one and God bless. Whoop.